Hello and welcome back to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. Joining me now, Milton Jones, Director of Operations, and Rachel Fazzino, Director of Training from the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. I want to welcome you both to the program. Thank you Good for evening. coming in. Thank, Thank you. you. So for people who may not be familiar, Milton, what is the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute? The Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute was established in 1994 after Lewis Brown, who was 15 years old, uh, was caught in a crossfire of two rival gangs having a so-called shootout. Mm -hmm. And on December 20th, 1993, he walked around the corner and was hit in the head with a bullet. Um, in 1994, his parents established the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. Mm -hmm. It was established um, to provide services to homicide victims um, and those otherwise affected by violence. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been going strong ever since. Um, and unfortunately, um, murders are still happening. Right, right. You but the, the, the Institute is really a needed commodity in the, in the neighborhood. And I think mm -hmm. um, one of the things that obviously spurred Tina to start this and uh, obviously the, the murder of her son, but one of the things that struck me was that she realized when she left the hospital, there was she kind of left empty-handed. Empty she had nothing. Right. She had no instruction. Right. She had no she guidance. She had nothing. And and from that point on, she decided that this is unacceptable and right. this can't happen. And she wanted to uh, make sure that it didn't happen. Right. And and, and establish the. Peace Institute. So what are some of the, the processes, if you will, that the Institute does in these situations? I don't know if, Rachel, you want to speak to that? Yeah, well, the Peace Institute, we support survivors in the immediate aftermath of homicides. Mm -hmm. um, we also support families whose loved ones um, have been incarcerated as well, because mm -hmm. in our community, we really try not to make a lot of those separations. Um, everybody's losing on all mm -hmm. sides. Mm -hmm. So we support all families. We also support um, schools in implementing peace curriculum that we've published and developed. Mm -hmm. And they're the first curriculum in the country to really teach loss and grief as part of children's social skills from the time that they're in kindergarten. So what are some of those teachings, if you can just give an abbreviated version? So if I have a, a child who's in first grade, what would she learn? So we really the curriculum is really set up so that talking about violence and talking about loss and grief things are not a by the way, mm -hmm. or it doesn't happen when something bad happens. So it's really something up front that you really start talking to kids about um, what is it like to miss somebody or what does the word grief mean? Mm -hmm. So that they can identify these things and that they can identify the way that they're feeling so that they're more in control of them, themselves right. and their actions. And, the and, and particularly since many um, of the children in schools, um, elementary schools these days, have had some sort of exposure to, mm -hmm. to violence, um, whether it's in, in the home, Mm -hmm. uh, domestic violence or in the street or hearing it talked about in the, in the neighborhood, in the community. So okay. it's very important that they learn these terms and learn how to, how to cope with these things. Do you think the kids, things. though, become desensitized with, you know, whether they're living in a home where there's domestic violence or they hear about different things on their in their neighborhoods to watching even television? And I, I hate to point the finger at television, but, you know, we mm -hmm. see all these images all the time or if you're living in a situation where that's the norm, it sort of desensitizes Absolutely. kids. Yeah. Well, it, it, there is a degree of desensitization. I mean, when you are uh, uh, exposed to violence on a regular basis, then it becomes almost commonplace. Right. And, uh, you know, when you hear these things happening, you're simply hearing it and you're saying, well, what's, what's for lunch? Right. Mm -hmm. exactly. I think it's also becomes being becoming desensitized is also a way that we cope with those things because mm -hmm. if you constantly thought about how tragic and how terrible some of these things are you wouldn't be able to go on and live your day-to-day -day life right. so i think you know it, it's both it's yeah. really both kind of things absolutely and i think too um and i know that you guys do this in the institute but it's really connecting with kids who are either in that situation or have experienced something um, but really, it's you try to get people in the community to also get involved and and 
respond to kids in a mm -hmm. positive way. I'll just give a quick example. So this was a year ago. Um, I live up on Fort Hill and uh, my boyfriend and I were driving home and there was a kid on a bike talking to somebody in the car and you know the light, light was green and they sort of kept talking and I lightly tapped on the horn and then went through a full cycle, hit my horn again when the light turned green for the second time and the kid actually threatened to stab me. Mm. And so my boyfriend and I were kind of like, okay, no, this, we're not going to let this slide. So we actually drove home. I have a friend who's a Boston police officer in the, in the area. So I called him. I'm like, are you working? He's like, yes. So he met us up at the park and I said, well, that's the kid. And we called the kid over and for, uh, for me and Miguel, it wasn't about getting the boy in trouble. It was about mm. having a teachable moment to say, you sure. can't say to somebody in a car, I'm going to stab you or I'm going to shoot you or whatever it is right. because you have no idea what could, I, you could open your mouth to somebody else. And the next thing you know, you know, mm -hmm. you're dead mm -hmm. on the street. Absolutely. And come to find out his cousin had been murdered a year before. So long story short, mm -hmm. we see this boy in the neighborhood all the time. We've become friends with him. Like Miguel's trying to mentor him to kind of send him on this right path. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that I think the Institute tries to do as well is sort of, there is a better way and you can sort of make something great out of yourself. Mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Everyone that comes into the Peace Institute, um, uh, is encouraged to do the right thing mm -hmm. um, and to not allow themselves to be um, exposed to further violence and to, and particularly, you know, re retaliation. Um, it, that's the untold story. You know, that's right. not um, something until now it's, it's publicized. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I have sat with uh, countless numbers of young men and certainly discourage uh, retaliatory uh, actions, mm -hmm. you know, and um, in many cases, it works. Right, absolutely. In many cases, they hear it and they recognize it and they understand it and they tend to move on, and it's a good thing. Yeah, I think for a, a lot of the young men, they just want somebody to hear them. Sure. You know, sure. so it's all, it's making that connection and, and letting them know that you care about them and not, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes they just think, well, nobody really cares about us or who cares sure. if, you know, they've mm. killed my friend, I'm going to do this. And talk a little bit about the principles, though, of the Institute, um, because there are a few that you guys are sort of your guiding <laughs> light, I suppose. Absolutely. They yeah. are. Um, uh, those principles are obviously not our words. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't create or develop those words. Mm -hmm. Those words are... Uh, can be found in, in, in the Bible, if you will. Um, and and it, it talks about all the things that are necessary to have in order to have a peace and a peaceful mindset. Um, and, and we use those as our, our guide. And at every staff meeting, we, we call it a, doing a check-in. We check in with the principles, love, faith, unity, mm -hmm. um, uh, forgiveness, and what have you. We check in with these and, and it's it's a powerful tool uh it, we we believe and many survivors believe it um it, it helps to ground us you know in in these principles mm -hmm. uh, if, if you have a foundation to stand on then you'll probably stand firm and stand strong mm -hmm. and that's what we do with the principles and we try to incorporate those principles in all the work we do mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely and yeah. i i can imagine that must get frustrating sometimes when you wake up and hear the news of another incident. Um, All Rachel, the time. Yeah, Rachel, mm -hmm. how do you deal with with stuff like that when you know you you wake up and something has happened and you have to kind of keep moving forward? Um, personally or professionally? <laughs> <Both>. <laughs> yeah, because it all intertwines. Mm -hmm. um, I think personally, it's it's really just grounding myself, you know, spiritually and also in those principles. And, you know, professionally, it's really like this is the work that we do. And so this is our purpose and that really grounds us. So it's really we put on kind of that armor and it's like we're about, you know, about to go on and, and do the business that we're here and put here to do mm -hmm. um, and do, do our mission as the Peace Institute. How did you both get involved with the Institute? <laughs> and and just, just to add to what she's saying that um, indeed, when I look at the news, uh, there is that degree of, um, you know, am I, am I failing? 
feeling here? Mm -hmm. Am I, you know, uh, yeah. yep. am, am I really making a difference? Am, am I doing this work correctly? Am I, you know, yep. um, and, and the answer becomes yes. The answer becomes yes, you, you're doing all that you can do. Right. Um, and that the world is what it is. And, and mm -hmm. there are other organizations doing good work and, and, and all of us really trying to come together to try and do it all, you know, seam, seamlessly and, 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 uh, and so we are making a difference, I believe. But it, it, it's um, disheartening to see and hear every day right. almost, you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How did you get involved with the Institute? Well, I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. I lost a son uh, at 18 years old, a stepson, um, also in 1993. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard about the Peace Institute and I was just uh, amazed at the work that they were doing mm -hmm. and decided that I would love to volunteer and, uh, and be involved. And so I, I went there and um, got involved and started as a, as a volunteer and uh, worked my way into a position mm -hmm. and, uh, because I, I fit, okay. you know. I, I fit there, they fit, <laughs> and we all fit as a unit. Uh, yeah. We are... We are very much like a family, right. you know. She's like my sister, you know. And, and, and Tina and I, we're we're uh, you know two peas in a pod, you know. Yeah. And we just uh, we just come together and we really you know mesh and, and really do the work and together. Yeah, and that's an important yeah. component to any Absolutely. job if you want to be successful and and mm -hmm. carry the work forward. Rachel, what about you? How did you get involved? Um, so at the same time as Milton, actually, kind of through some connections that I had with him, um, I started interning there, and same thing, just never left. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. After my internship was over, I just stayed on volunteering and literally never left. <laughs> Position, mm -hmm. you know, posi different positions came open. You know, we get different grants and stuff, mm -hmm. so always just worked my way in with those different things and just mm -hmm. been really committed to the Peace Institute. Um, as a young professional, a lot of times people ask, I've been there almost eight years now, yeah. so a lot of times as a young professional, people ask, oh, well, what's your next move or something? And I, I don't feel like, you know, I feel like my time is still present at the Peace Institute. Right. I've gained so much personally and professionally from working there and had so much opportunity for growth, um, and there's a lot more work to be done, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. We'll be there. You guys just moved offices. So how, we did. how um, is that impacting the work that the Institute is doing? You should ask how that's impacting me. Because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I'm exhausted. It's a pretty big headache for you, I'm sure. I'm exhausted, yes. 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 I yes. mean, you know, obviously being the director of operations, you know, part of my job is to make sure that we operate yeah. properly. And we can't operate without phones. And we can't operate without computers. We yeah. can't operate, you know. And so all these things have to be in place. Um, and it's my, my, my job and my obligation to, to get these things in place. Um, and so we're doing that. We we uh, we just moved Saturday. Wow. Um, and, you are exhausted. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, and uh, we um, things are up and running. The, you know, the systems are up and running. We're still tweaking some things as as it goes with changes. You know, um, but we're still doing that. And, and but we're excited. We're excited about the move. Um, we uh, are in a place that we feel uh, will easily take on our personality. It, it, it seems to be a, a place that fits us and we fit it, you know. Right. Um, it's a, um, it's a, a house on, on Christopher Street, 15 mm -hmm. Christopher Street in Dorchester, only about two blocks away from where we were. It's mm -hmm. walking distance. Um, and it's uh, upstairs and downstairs. Um, and we situated it so that the staff uh, is upstairs mm -hmm. so that clients don't necessarily have to climb the stairs and right. whatnot. Um, and then the clients areas or survivors and, and, and areas, families areas is downstairs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the therapeutic areas are downstairs, mm -hmm. you know. But we're really excited about the move. It's, um, it's all coming together, you know, in a good way. And we're open for business. We didn't shut Absolutely. down for a day. <laughs> we have so. to be. <laughs> we have to be. That's yeah. good. Rachel, talk a little bit about their, the Survivors um, Leadership Academy. Sure. So the Survivors Leadership Academy was developed by Tina because 
after survivors lose a loved one, there's all these different systems and things that people now have to work with it within their lives. They have to understand the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. understand how the investigation process works with the homicide detectives, mm -hmm. and also understand what are the different resources and supports that are out there for them and their families. It's like, it's like you have to live a whole new life, learn how to live a whole new life after. So the Survivors Leadership Academy is a series of different workshops pertaining to whatever survivors might be saying they want at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's, we try to do it in three weeks. So we have a three weeks, we have a pre-session so that families can get prepared for the workshop. Maybe it's with um, the homicide detectives. We'll bring them in and they'll talk about how to do the investigation process. And survivors will get a chance to ask whatever questions are pressing for them and their family. And then the third week is really like a debrief mm -hmm. and maybe planning next steps. The cool thing about the Survivors Leadership Academy is that we've been able to partner with the Children's Room in Arlington. Mm -hmm. And so we co-lead children's groups at the same time right. as when the adults are meeting. Um, parents would always, you know, bring their children. Kids like coming to the Peace Institute, also child care needs. So right. it seemed like the, the best thing to do. And it's been really successful. and. We're really looking forward to doing a lot more with the Survivors Leadership Academy in this next year. That's great. Mm -hmm. The Peace Fellow Internship, Internship Program is another offering. Mm -hmm. So us. the Peace Fellows Internship Program, we've always had a lot of interns at the Peace Institute, mm -hmm. myself yeah. being one of them. Um, so I personally know how great of an opportunity it is to learn from the community and learn from survivors themselves. Mm -hmm. They are the true professionals in this work. Mm -hmm. And so what the Peace Fellow Program does, it offers an opportunity to students to be able to come into the community, do their internships there, whether it's from social work schools, education schools, um, business, marketing, and um, anything you know related to our work, mm -hmm. to be able to come in, get that, that firsthand experience, mm -hmm. and so that once they do graduate and then they go out into the field and they're working in the community, they're much more prepared. Right from the community's perspective. How many interns are there normally? We This past year, we had about four interns mm -hmm. from schools of social work, master's level um, social work students. Right. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, obviously, when things happen, um, there are all these costs associated with um, burials and, and whatnot. Um, the Rest in Peace Fund, does that help with those sorts of costs? It does. Um, not yet. <laughs> what, 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 it, what it does or will do, um, in the past, it was established. Um, initially, it, it was started by Partners Healthcare that, that donated $10,000 to start uh, what was then called the Burial Fund. Mm -hmm. um, and we used those funds for families who were unable to uh, raise the funds for the, the cemetery portion of, mm -hmm. of the burial. Um, um, there is uh, what is known as victim compensation uh, fee from the attorney general's office, right. and that uh, uh, at that time was $6,500, and and that would pay for the funeral essentially. But families were um, expected to come up with the the cemetery costs, and so this burial fund would cover that cost. Um, now. Uh, we are hoping to uh, reestablish this burial fund um, because if no one uh, donates to it, then it's not a fund at all. Right. Um, so we're hoping that folks would donate to that fund. So how do um, people, and it would serve the same purpose. How do people donate to the fund? Um, they would be able to go on our website and there would be a link there to donate to that fund. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I'll, I'll put our own plug in, www.ldb peaceinstitute.org and uh, people could go there or yeah. call us for more information. Yeah, yeah, I think that is a is a piece that, um, you know, oftentimes people don't really think about that, I suppose, mm -hmm. in the whole process, um, especially if you're not directly associated with somebody who's been killed. You know, it's sort mm -hmm. of a uh, lackadaisical attitude about, oh, well, whatever. But right. these things do cost money, and, and everybody Absolutely. should have a burial, a proper burial, whatever mm -hmm. the family wants for them, and mm -hmm. that does cost money. So yeah. I mean, a regular, a regular financial crisis is bad enough. Right. I mean, we all you know, have situations where we, we may find ourselves uh, 
uh, having some difficulty paying certain bills or mm -hmm. things like that or certain funds are not coming in the way that we thought it should. Right. And, and now that's a sort of crisis. Um, and so just imagine, you know, uh, suddenly mm -hmm. uh, you lose a loved one and particularly to, to violence. Right. I mean, that's uh, the, uh, uh, such a violation, you know, on one's life. Mm -hmm. um, and now you have a financial burden to deal with on top of that, it is just uh, so so uh, so difficult to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Rachel, talk about the Peace Zone. So the Peace Zone curriculum is the one that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. That's really the first in the country to include teaching of loss and grief mm -hmm. to children as young as kindergarten. And what I that was one of the things that I first started working on at the Peace Institute when I came in. And one of the powerful things about it is. There's so many educators in the schools that are like me, young, white, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily from a neighborhood that where we grew up around a lot of violence. So mm -hmm. I think what I've heard from a lot of teachers and what I know for myself is some awkwardness or hesitation. How do I talk to my students? How do I support them? How do I support their families? This mm -hmm. isn't part of my experience. How do right. I do this? And so what the Peace Zone really does, it gives a tool to those teachers, to all teachers really, um, to be able to kind of cross some of those barriers, um, whether they're the personal barriers, what I think it really does is it gets, gets mm -hmm. us to really think about our experiences around loss. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily have to be around violence. Right. We talk to the students, they lost their pet or a friend moved away, right. the loss of a grandparent. Right. People are experiencing losses on a regular basis, mm -hmm. a divorce. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it really allows the educator themselves to kind of do some internal work and understand what is useful for them, and then that way it translates to their right, students. Right, because there's always a way to make that connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No matter how mm -hmm. horrifying you know the kid's situation is, you can always pull something from your yeah. own personal story that can sort of relate and make that connection. Right. And like I said earlier, I think a lot of it is just making that connection with some of these kids so that they feel like they're being heard. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes, you know, we have programs and different uh, organizations that help out kids, and that's great, but we're still missing a block of kids that we're not hitting because we're not talking to those kids to find out what it is that interests you. How can we, you know, bring them in? And, and you know, obviously sometimes they're from broken homes, and who knows what the situation is mm -hmm, when they mm -hmm. get back in the door at night. So it's really breaking into those kids and saying, mm -hmm. okay, I'm talking to you now. Right. What do you need? Mm -hmm. How can we help you? Yeah, it's, it's simple mm -hmm. and it's complex, of course. Right. And it's really, it really allows an opportunity to create a safe space to have some of those hard conversations mm -hmm. that don't happen on a regular basis. There's also the, the book, Always in My Heart. Yes, so, so Always in My Heart is a workbook specifically for grieving children. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we give to families when we meet with them. They get as many copies of that guide as that they need for the children and their families. And it's also something that a lot of the schools and school social workers have used as well yeah. with the students. And it's really like a window into the hearts and the minds of children. Mm -hmm. And it gives, again, it gives the adults and the children's lives a, a tool to be able to use with them. Sometimes it's so hard to start up these conversations. Right. Um, it's some children are really expressive and they want to talk about it all the time others don't right. and so mm -hmm. it gives them opportunity to draw to write mm -hmm. and also suggestions for things you could do as a family to really remember the person's life not to remember how they died right. but to remember what the, who were they what was right. their life mm -hmm. and that's the mm -hmm. other important mm -hmm. thing too is that you know getting past that point of being angry about a life being taken and understanding that you know Yes, you can feel that feeling, but at a certain point you have to be able to move on and remember that person for who they were to you sure. and not how they died. Well, you know, one of the most important things about the Peace Institute is, is that it's survivor-led. Mm -hmm. And um, there's nothing more comforting for a survivor to hear from you right. that you, you've been there, yep. that you have some sense of what they're going through and what they might be feeling yeah. and, and, you know, the emotions that are coming up for them, you know. Um, and so that is one of the unique uh, and one of the ways about it. the Institute does this is with the Mother's Day Peace Walk. It happens every year, yes. every Mother's Day. Yes. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about that. I know obviously Mother's Day has passed, but for folks who wanted to join in next May. Yeah, it's an mm -hmm. amazing, amazing it event. It is indeed. And it's... Yeah. 
it's so widespread too. It touches so many different communities across the state, across New England. We have people mm -hmm. coming from Connecticut and New Hampshire and all different mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. So it really is that type of space where I talked about, you just have to create a safe space. Right. Everyone's coming together. No words need to even be spoken. Yeah. It's sort of when you're there, it's a feeling that you have. Yeah. And the walk has grown. I, this was mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. eighth or ninth walk this year and it's doubled yeah. in size and typically it's, it's drawn um you know upwards of five thousand people and then uh, the last couple of years it has drawn upwards of ten thousand people um huge mm -hmm. uh, and one and of the, one of the things is that you know families and folks in the community uh wait for this walk to take place right. uh, it's a time when these families who have been broken can come together to sort of, for that day, mend, right. if right. you will, and and they do, and we all come together, and and I mean it's a it's a a joyous time, it's a sad time, it's a emotional time, yeah. it's a a difficult time, it's a good time, <laughs> yeah. it's you you know what it's I mean. So it's really it's seven, really yeah. a, a, a multitude of emotions that's taking place, and but it's just. It's just fantastic. It, it really is right. you know, to see folks come together in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap up again, um, Milton, why don't you give people at home the website address um, if they're curious mm -hmm. about getting involved or want to make a donation to the fund? Um, Absolutely. Um, it's um, uh, ldbpeaceinstitute.org, of course, www. Um, uh, the number is uh, 617-825-1917. Uh, we're open for volunteers, uh, and, and and I must say that our volunteers uh, are the glue of the Peace Institute. They do amazing work, I mean, and, and they do tireless work, and we are so grateful to our volunteers. And, and for the Mother's Day Walk, many volunteers come and they pitch in and they make that happen mm -hmm. and we're just so grateful so those of you that want to come out and want to volunteer and want to see our space and, and come and, and uh, it's a safe space that we provide for folks who are going through something and come visit come see what what it looks like and who we are and um, you'll be blessed Absolutely. Milton and mm -hmm. Rachel, I want to thank you so much for being here and talking about the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. Thank you. That's thank going you. to do it for us here tonight on Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. We'll see you next time.